I thought what an appropriate time to allow somebody to just kind of share some thoughts. And so I asked David if he would come up and just share some thoughts um, about his mom today. And uh, then we'll go from there, all right? How y'all doing this morning? Uh, all right. So y'all know me and my mama, you know, two of the loudest people y'all ever meet. And Amen. so my mama, she's a very difficult woman, I'm going to be honest. Wow. A lot to do with, but no matter where I've been, no matter what I've gone through, no matter what type of person I have been, if I was an angry, sad, happy, or whatever, she's always been there right by my side, and she's one of the sweetest people you would ever meet, just don't make her mad, which I do a lot, <laughs> but, and she, she's like my best friend, you know, say oh you're just being over dramatic no she is my best friend we spend pretty much every day together even without this quarantine and i'm not gonna lie she's the greatest mother i will ever have well, which <laughs> i've only had one but, <laughs> but she is a loving caring wonderful person and i would not be the person who i am today without her she she has shown me a lot in my years. She has shown me how to love. She has shown me how to care for God. I would not be here like right now if it wasn't for her. I would probably be at home not caring about any of this. But with her, I'm here today. And I may not have the greatest life story or the greatest you know, life, but I have a wonderful life because of her. And I, no, no one, no one tells me at all. She is the greatest mother I will ever have. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Now we could, we could spend all afternoon and have folks continue to come up and share stories, but I also asked Cindy to come and share a story. All right. And so um, I'm going to give her the mic. And she's going to hold it together, and she's going to share the story. For those of you who don't know, Darling Boyette is my precious mother. She left Ohio to marry her sweetheart, Bryant, and then moved to South Georgia. And there she helped Dad on the family farm for several years. But then in later years, they decided to move to Middle Georgia, where she helped my dad start an electrical business. They raised four girls and attended First Church of the Nazarene in Warner Robins, Georgia. She served as a Sunday school teacher and a choir member for several years later. She taught us girls sewing, love of music, gardening, Christian principles, and cooking. I have a childhood memory where I go to ask my mom for something, and I find her on her knees in prayer praying for her family, her friends, the community, the country. Uh, she didn't know I'd listen sometimes, but I did. And it would be behind closed doors. I could hear her crying and praying for so many. I asked my girls, what do you remember about, or what would you say about your grandmother? I have two girls. One of them said, a saint, selfless, humble, and gracious. The other said a godly woman, prayerful, thoughtful, a kind spirit. Amen. The only thing my mom ever asked of me was to promise to meet her in heaven one day. And as I grew older, that's a lot to ask of somebody when you're little and you make that promise. But that's what has held me steady to that Christian path. And as Proverbs 3.15 says, she is more precious than rubies. Thank you, Mom, for your unconditional love and Christian heritage that you provided. You are a blessing, and I love you. Now stay right here, stay right here, stay right here, stay right here. Your girls couldn't be here today. But 
I got a note. So uh, Chelsea sent this to me yesterday, and she said, it's three generations and soon to be four. We've had no shortage of strong, godly women ahead of us and our family, and we're so, so blessed. When we think of our mom, we think of the glue that holds our family together. And I would say that she thinks the same of her mother, our grandmother, Darlene. Her selfless, positive, kindness, and generosity are always at the forefront of what she does. We are so thankful for the example that she has always shown us and hope to continue to grow to one day become half the woman she is today. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. We love you. Caitlin and Chelsea. Aww. Last week and over the last couple of weeks, the few weeks, we've been talking about kingdom encounters. And we have been walking through these passages. And remember, if we back up in Luke, we start seeing where we see the genealogy of Jesus. And then we see where Jesus comes and John baptizes him. Then Jesus is, begins his ministry. He is tempted in the wilderness. And he spends those 40 days and nights in the wilderness. Then he begins traveling around and moving throughout the countryside, moving throughout the cities and begins teaching and begins healing. And he's working and he's moving through. And it's in these scenes that we came to a few weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, where we saw the story of these four men bringing their paralyzed friend. There was a desperation to get him to Jesus' feet. One of them, at least one of them in that group said, if we can just get him to the feet of Jesus, maybe, just maybe, healing could take place. These men were creative. They had to get strategic. They couldn't get through the crowd. So what they do, they went up on the roof, broke a hole in the roof, and lowered their friend to the feet of Jesus. You also recognize, and if you remember in that passage, that Jesus took care of the first immediate need. Friends, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Amen. Then the question started coming. How can he do this? And Jesus knew that was going on. And he said, okay, so that you might believe, arise. Take up your mat and go home. But keep in mind, Jesus met the first initial need. Your sins are forgiven. That's our most immediate need today. Amen? Amen. Our sins are forgiven. He'll take care of those other needs and He'll meet those other needs if we allow Him to continue to work. <coughs> Remember, and I taught you this and I said this a few weeks ago. You don't have to be one of the greatest, uh, one with the greatest faith right. or even the best understanding of Scripture to impact somebody's life for eternity. Yes. We've given you opportunities today. Go by and get some bread. Take it to somebody. Give it to somebody. Use that. <clears throat> Last week we moved into where Jesus called where Jesus called Matthew the tax collector and they got together for a dinner. And Jesus went to this dinner, right? right. People don't care what you know until they know how much you care. You need to remember that. People don't know, people don't care what you know until they know how much you care. Good. Try and keep my pages from flipping on me today. <laughs> today we're going to be in Luke chapter 6. And uh, before we go there, I want to ask you guys a question. Do you remember the story I told you guys a couple of weeks ago about Steve? And Steve was having a rough day, and so I just loaded him up. He came over to the house, and I had a lawnmower hooked up and had a weed eater. And we hooked up and we went out and cut Grim Reaper's patch grass. I want you to know something as I, as I continue to think about that. I want you to think about this. If I had made coming to church a prerequisite for having a relationship with these guys, I wouldn't have a relationship with these guys today. 
they weren't at that point and they weren't at that place in their life to be ready for that. Right. So we went to them. That's what we're called to. We can't put a demand on somebody. You have to come to church in order to be able to come into relationship. No. That's right. What we talk about last week. We can go to the porch. We can take that bread and go to a neighbor's house and step up on the porch and just drop it off at their door. Put a little note on there. I just wanted you to know that I'm thinking about you, that I care for you, and that Jesus loves you. Yeah. I hope this blesses your home. You don't even have to know them. Yeah. That porch or that sidewalk conversation can make drastic changes in somebody's life. Right, right, right. Then the opportunity may come to get a little more intentional, to invite them into the living room. And be able to sit around and start talking and start sharing some of life experiences, some of your struggles, some of your struggles and some of your questions with God. We all have those. I have them. I still have them. But that's okay. We allow people into the living room. We allow people into those conversations and, we, and we're willing to be vulnerable and willing to be transparent. And it gives people an opportunity to see and to know that there is hope. You can share those stories. You can share those struggles. You can share those challenges. Right. I want you to know something. Remember, you have to understand that this dinner that Jesus was at was very strategic and with a purpose. From here forward, Jesus models what it means to dine with all kinds of people. That is kingdom come. Our table can't be selective. Our table can't be something that we right. just welcome those who fit our niche. Right? Right? Amen. right? right. Amen. It is to be an open table. It is to be a table that, that is welcoming and inviting. And we want to invite our friends there. We had over a dozen visitors last Sunday right here. I don't know about you guys, but I am enjoying this time outside. I spent 18 years riding a motorcycle across the United States and all over the place and preaching at bike rallies and preaching at clubhouses and doing services at events going on. I like being outside. I like it. And I'm enjoying this time together. And as long as we're permitted to and as long as it's still safe, this is what we're going to do, all right? Right now, we're looking at at least June before we think about going back in the building. And we may push that off some more, okay? We're just kind of trying to go with the flow, just relax. People are still trying to figure things out, and that's okay. We're facing stuff that we've never faced before, right? right. It's been generations since we've gone through any type of quarantines or any type of big major pandemics like this so we're just having to learn to walk through this new thing and that's okay and we're going to stay positive in it because the gospel doesn't change amen? amen the gospel does not change and we still have opportunity and we have opportunity to speak hope into those lives that may feel hopeless we have opportunity to bring healing in the loaf of bread to those that may not have a meal. We have opportunity to just share our lives and share our fears. And it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to have those struggles. As we walk into this other passage today, in Luke chapter 6, I'll be starting at verse 6 and working through 11. And I'm going to read it out of, if my phone hadn't died. Come on, baby, there it is. I'm going to read this today out of the uh, translation that Brian read from earlier. Luke chapter 6, starting at verse 6. On another Sabbath, Jesus went into the synagogue and taught. And a man was there whose right hand was paralyzed. Some of the teachers of the law and some of the Pharisees wanted a reason to accuse Jesus of doing wrong. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to the man, Stand up and come here to the front. The man got up and stood there. 
Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, what does our law allow us to do on the Sabbath? To help or to harm? Man, think about that question. To save someone's life or to destroy it? He looked around at them all. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he did, and his hand became well again. They were filled with rage and began to discuss among themselves what they could do to Jesus. Think about that question that he asked. What are we supposed to do on the Sabbath? Help or harm? I remember, I remember my mom on a number of occasions set me down and set my brother and I down and just simply said, I haven't made good choices. My relationship with your real dad didn't work out and that was broken and I've tried to do my absolute best but I've made all kinds of mistakes. And boys, I want you to know that I love you and I'm doing the best I know how to do. But I'm not always going to get it right. Man, that vulnerability spoke into my life. That vulnerability spoke truth to me and, and helped me realize that I don't have to have all the answers. That I don't have to have it all figured out. I don't have to know exactly how to answer everything. My mom said it's okay to admit if you make a mistake. And she did that. And I remember even sitting down with my daughter and having those conversations with my daughter after all those years of drinking and using and just wild and crazy. And I remember having to sit down and today, even now, 23 years later, there are times that I have to sit down with my daughter and say, honey, I'm sorry I blew it. I wasn't there at some of those important times in your life. I didn't always make the best choices. I didn't make good decisions. I didn't speak well to you. I didn't speak well to mom. I didn't do things right. It's been an opportunity for healing. So you think back at this, and here are these pomp and pious men who are so protective of the law. And Jesus knew exactly what they were up to. What's it better to do on the Sabbath? To heal or to harm? And we are to heal. We are to bring healing. In the midst of all this stuff that's going on, we need to speak healing. We need to speak truth. Please don't use Facebook as a political platform with everything that's going on. Put that truth out. Put, put Scripture on there. Put an opportunity for sharing time with family in those times. Sissy, I keep watching you, all the pictures you're pass, pass, uh, putting up with those grandbabies. I love seeing it. I love seeing that. Think about the joys and think about the experiences that we are getting right now. Those times to kind of just slow down and stop and spend intentional time with family. We need that, right? As a nation, we need that. We needed to slow down. Amen. We've lost our focus. We've gotten so caught up in the race and so caught up in everything going on. So caught up trying to get ours. That in some cases, we've lost that opportunity with our families. I've often told our guys in Bikers for Christ, Jesus first, then your family, then the other things will work themselves out. If you lose your ministry to your family, you have lost your ministry. It has to happen. You've got to keep those orders right. And yes, there's going to be times when it's going to be that wheel's going to be turning and other things are going to be happening. What are we supposed to do on the Sabbath? Heal or harm? Heal. Jesus treated the man that was sick on the Sabbath by putting his needs above the man-made rule of the day. 
That may have been the only opportunity he would see this man. The atmosphere was right. And he took that opportunity and he knew that he was going to be criticized. We may be criticized for gathering here today. And so long as we do the right thing and we try and make sure and respect everybody, that's okay and we're going to continue to do this. Amen. And there's some of us that say, I am so over this, I'm ready just to get back to normal. I get that. But there are also those who say, I'm scared to death. I don't know who I'm going to come in contact with, what I'm going to come in contact with that could get me sick. Right. So we're going to respect that. Amen? Amen. We're going to make sure that we are healers and that we speak healing words. That we speak truth. That's what Jesus did. That's what we're called to do. Amen? Amen. Notice that Jesus, in the midst of this, Jesus never compromised the law of God. He did not compromise the law of God. He may have challenged the law of man. But he did not compromise the law of God. And we have to keep that in mind. I remember when I got a calling to be in biker ministries. And we started our own biker ministry. And we called it the Unchained Gang. And it had a, I'll have to bring it one of these days and show it to you. It had a red and white patch. It was three-piece. It had a Tennessee rocker on it. Now, you guys, that may not be a big deal to you, but in the club world, that is a huge deal. Right. Having that three-piece patch and having that Tennessee chapter on the bottom end of it meant we were claiming territory. <laughs> and we started out totally wrong. We did it absolutely wrong. We spent probably close to $1,500 making patches. And we wanted to go minister to the club world and go minister to these guys. And we started off wrong right off the bat. When we started making the phone calls and trying to get permission and trying to do things the right way, they said, wrong colors. This is a black and white state. The outlaws control this state. Red and white colors we don't like. Okay. Okay. You got unchained gang. We're not gangs. We're a motorcycle club. So that's another strike. And then you have a three-piece patch on. You're not an MC. You're not a one percenter. Take that patch off. We basically just cut every patch off of every one of our guys' backs and put them away because we started wrong. And we were doing more destruction than we were good. Think about that in terms of the church. If we set a standard and we set something so high that people don't feel comfortable coming in, we've just destroyed that opportunity to be able to minister to them. Amen? Amen. Come to the table. Come to the table. All are welcome. Come through these doors. Come in. You will be loved. And i got to tell you, Bethel Church, if you're a visitor today... I double dog dare you to come back. You will be loved. I double dog dare you. And that's a southern way of uh, I double dog dare you. You're going to be loved. You're going to be welcomed. You're going to be accepted for exactly who you are and where you are right now in your life today. And we will welcome you into relationship and we will walk with you in those struggles and we'll walk with you in those challenges. Why? Because we choose to bring healing and not harm. Amen. 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 And that's our motto, and that's who we are, and that's where we are. That's the DNA of this church. Good. That has been the DNA of this church since this church was founded. And I'm new into it, but I love the heritage of this church, and I love the legacy, and the way this church has reached out beyond itself, welcoming folks in to come play softball. Man, I'd love to play softball again. I don't know if my arm could take it. But we have opportunity, and we'll find new and creative ways to continue to reach out, to continue to minister. We will take the approach and follow the rules. Then we will talk 
or will reach out a hand and say, come, all who are heavy laden and heavy burdened, and you can find rest. Because He promised us that. Amen? Amen. Think back on these stories. Kingdom connections. Forming intentional relationships. What are those areas that I can start forming relationships in? We'll give you opportunity today. Go grab some bread. Go grab a dessert. Take it to somebody who may need it today. They may not need it, but it may just be a great way to just say, hey, you matter. You have value. You have worth. And I'm glad you're in my life today. Yeah. Let's pray.